the kidnapped Prime Minister by Agatha Christie, retold by Mina Morris. Now that war and war problems are things of the past, I think it's safe to tell the world the part my friend Poirot played in a critical moment for our nation. The secret was well kept. The news never reached the press. But now, there's no need for secrecy, and I think England should know what it owes to my smart little friend, who stopped a big disaster. One evening after dinner, I won't say the exact date, but it was when peace by negotiation was what England's enemies were saying. My friend and I were in his rooms. I had a job related to recruiting after leaving the army, and I would visit Poirot in the evenings to talk about any interesting cases he had. I tried to talk to him about the big news that day. Someone tried to kill Mr. David McAdam. The Prime Minister of England. The newspapers didn't give many details, only that he had a close call, with the bullet just touching his cheek. I thought our police must have been very careless for this to happen. I knew that German agents in England would risk a lot to do this. Fighting Mac, as his own party called him, had fought against the growing pacifist ideas. He was more than England's Prime Minister. He was England and to remove him would have been a big blow to Britain. Poirot was busy cleaning a grey suit with a small sponge. He loved neatness and order. Now, with the smell of benzene in the air, he couldn't focus on me. In a little minute, I am with you, my friend. I have almost finished. The grease spot is not good. I remove it like this. He waved his sponge. I smiled and lit another cigarette. Anything interesting going on? I asked after a few minutes. I'm helping a cleaning lady find her husband. A difficult task needing tact. I think when he's found he won't be happy. What can you do? I agree with him. He was smart to lose himself. I laughed. Finally, the grease spot is gone. I can talk to you now. What do you think about this attempt to kill Macadam? Childish, answered Poirot quickly. It's hard to take seriously. Firing a rifle never works. It's an old idea. It was close to working this time, I reminded him. Poirot shook his head. He was about to answer when the landlady said there were two men downstairs who wanted to see him. They won't give their names, but they say it's very important. Let them come up, said Poirot, folding his grey pants. In a few minutes, the two visitors came in, and I was surprised to see that one of them was Lord Estere, leader of the House of Commons, and the other was Mr. Bernard Dodge, a member of the War Cabinet and a close friend of the Prime Minister. Monsieur Poirot? asked Lord Astaire. My friend bowed. The important man looked at me and hesitated. My business is private. You can speak freely in front of Captain Hastings, said my friend, telling me to stay. He doesn't have all the gifts. No, but I trust his discretion. Lord Astaire still hesitated, but Mr. Dodge spoke quickly. Let's not waste time. The whole of England will know our problems soon enough. Time is important. Please sit down, gentlemen, said Poirot politely. Will you take the big chair, my lord? Lord Astaire was surprised. You know me? Poirot smiled. Of course. I read the newspapers with pictures. How could I not know you? Monsieur Poirot? I need your help on a very important matter. We need complete secrecy. You have the word of Hercule Poirot. I can't say more, said my friend, in a big way. It's about the Prime Minister. We have a big problem. We're in trouble, added Mr. Dodge. Is the injury bad? I asked. What injury? The bullet wound. Oh, that! Mr. Dodge said without care, That's old news. 
as my colleague says, continued Lord Astaire, that matter is finished. Luckily, it didn't work. I wish I could say the same for the second attempt. There was a second attempt? Yes, but different. Monsieur Poirot, the Prime Minister, has disappeared. What? He's been kidnapped. Impossible, I said, shocked. Poirot gave me a strong look, telling me to be quiet. Sadly, even if it seems impossible, it's true, continued his lordship. Poirot looked at Mr. Dodge. You said time is everything. What did you mean? The two men looked at each other, and then Lord Astaire said, You know about the coming Allied conference? My friend nodded. For good reasons, no details about when and where it will happen have been given, but the date is known in diplomatic circles. The conference is tomorrow evening in Versailles. Now you see how serious the situation is. I won't hide from you that the Prime Minister's presence is very important. The pacifist ideas, started by German agents, have been growing. Everyone thinks the Prime Minister's strong personality will be the turning point of the conference. His absence could lead to bad results, maybe a quick and bad peace. No one else can go in his place. He alone can represent England. Poirot's face became serious. You think the kidnapping of the Prime Minister is to stop him from being at the conference? I do. He was on his way to France at that time. And the conference is? Tomorrow night at nine o'clock. Poirot took a big watch from his pocket. It's now quarter to nine. Twenty-four hours, said Mr. Dodge, thinking. And a quarter, Poirot corrected. Don't forget the quarter, sir. It could be useful. Now for the details, did the kidnapping happen in England or France? In France. Mr. McAdam went to France this morning. He was to stay tonight with the commander-in-chief, then go to Paris tomorrow. He was taken across the channel by a destroyer. In Boulogne, he was met by a car from General Headquarters and one of the Commander-in-Chief's ADCs. Well? Well, they left Boulogne, but never arrived. What? Monsieur Poirot, it was a fake car and a fake ADC. The real car was found in a side road, with the driver and the ADC tied up and gagged. And the fake car? is still missing. Poirot showed impatience. Unbelievable! It can't stay hidden for long. So we thought. It seemed like just searching carefully was needed. That part of France is under military law. We believe the car couldn't stay hidden long. The French police, our own Scotland Yard men, and the military are doing their best. It is, as you say, unbelievable but nothing has been found. At that moment, someone knocked on the door, and a young officer came in with a sealed envelope, which he gave to Lord Astaire. Just received from France, sir. I brought it here, as you ask. The minister opened it quickly and made a sound. The officer left. Here is news at last. This message has just been decoded. They found the second car, and the secretary, Daniels, Unconscious, gagged, and tied up in an empty farm near C, he remembers nothing except something being pressed against his mouth and nose from behind, and trying to get free. Police believe his statement is true. And they found nothing else? No. Not the Prime Minister's dead body? Then there is hope. But it's strange. Why, after trying to shoot him this morning, are they now working so hard to keep him alive? Dodge shook his head. One thing is certain. They want to stop him from going to the conference at any cost. If it is possible, the Prime Minister will be there. I hope it's not too late. Now, gentlemen, tell me everything from the beginning. I must know about the shooting, too. Last night, the Prime Minister, with one of his secretaries, Captain Daniels, 
The same who went with him to France? Yes. As I was saying, they drove to Windsor, where the Prime Minister had a meeting. Early this morning, he came back to town, and the assassination attempt happened on the way. Wait, please. Who is this Captain Daniels? Do you have information about him? Lord Astaire smiled. I thought you would ask. We don't know much about him. He's not from a special family. He served in the English army and is a very good secretary knowing many languages. I think he speaks seven languages. That's why the Prime Minister chose him to go to France. Does he have any family in England? Two aunts, a Mrs Everard, who lives in Hampstead, and a Miss Daniels, who lives near Ascot. Ascot? That's close to Windsor, right? We didn't overlook that, but it led to nothing. So you think Captain Daniels can be trusted? A bit of sadness came into Lord Estes' voice as he replied, No, Monsieur Poirot. These days I would think twice before trusting anyone. Very well. Now I understand, my lord, that the Prime Minister would usually be protected by police, which should make any attack on him impossible. Lord Estere nodded. That's true. The Prime Minister's car was followed by another car with detectives in plain clothes. Mr. McAdam didn't know about these precautions. He is a brave man and wouldn't want them. But of course the police make their own plans. In fact, the Premier's driver, O'Murphy, is a CID man. O'Murphy? That's an Irish name, right? Yes, he's Irish. From which part of Ireland? County Clare, I think. Interesting. Continue, my lord. The Premier left for London. The car was closed. He and Captain Daniels sat inside. The second car followed as usual. But sadly, for some unknown reason, the Prime Minister's car left the main road. At a place where the road bends? asked Poirot. Yes, but how did you know? Oh, it's clear. Continue. For some unknown reason, continued Lord Astaire, the Premier's car left the main road. The police car, not knowing this, stayed on the main road. After a short distance down the quiet lane, the Prime Minister's car was stopped by a group of masked men. The driver, that brave O'Murphy, said Poirot thoughtfully. The driver, surprised, hit the brakes. The Prime Minister looked out of the window. Right away a shot was heard, then another. The first one just hit his cheek, the second missed. The driver, now aware of the danger, quickly drove ahead, making the men move away. A close escape, I said, feeling scared. Mr. McAdam didn't want to make a big deal about the small wound he had. He said it was just a scratch. He stopped at a local small hospital, where it was taken care of. He didn't say who he was. He then drove straight to Charing Cross, where a special train for Dover was waiting for him. After a quick explanation of what happened was given to the worried police by Captain Daniels, he left for France. At Dover, he got on the waiting ship. At Boulogne, as you know, the fake car was waiting for him with the Union Jack flag, and everything correct. That's all you can tell me? Yes. Is there any other thing you haven't told me, my lord? Well, there is one strange thing. Yes? The Prime Minister's car didn't go back home after leaving the Prime Minister at Charing Cross. The police wanted to talk to O'Murphy, so they looked for the car right away. The car was found outside a bad little restaurant in Soho, which is famous as a place where German agents meet. And the driver? The driver was nowhere to be found. He had disappeared too. So, said Poirot, thinking, there are two people missing, the Prime Minister in France and O'Murphy in London. He looked closely at Lord Estere, who looked hopeless. I can only tell you, Monsieur Poirot, 
that if someone had told me yesterday that O'Murphy was a traitor, I would have laughed. And today? Today I don't know what to think. Poirot nodded seriously. He looked at his big watch again. I understand that I can do what I want, gentlemen. In every way, I mean. I must be able to go where I want and how I want. Of course, there's a special train leaving for Dover in an hour, with more people from Scotland Yard. You'll be with a military officer and a CID, man who will help you in every way. Is that okay? Sure. One more question before you go, gentlemen. Why did you come to me? I'm not famous in your big London. We found you because a very important person from your country told us to. Really? My old friend the Prefect? Lord Astaire shook his head. Someone more important than the Prefect. Someone who was once very powerful in Belgium and will be again. England has promised. Poirot quickly saluted. Amen to that. Ah, oh, my master doesn't forget. Gentlemen, I, Hercule Poirot, will help you faithfully. I hope it's not too late, but this is dark, dark. I can't see. Well, Poirot, I said, feeling impatient, what do you think? My friend was quickly packing a small suitcase. He shook his head, thinking, I don't know what to think. My mind is not helping me. Why, as you said, kidnap him when hitting him on the head would work too, I thought. Excuse me, my friend, but I didn't exactly say that. It's definitely better for them to kidnap him. But why? Because not knowing causes fear. That's one reason. If the Prime Minister was dead, it would be terrible, but people would have to face it. But now, you don't know what to do. Will the Prime Minister come back or not? Is he dead or alive? No one knows, and until they know, nothing certain can be done. And like I said, not knowing causes fear, which is what the enemies want. Also, if the kidnappers are hiding him somewhere, they can make deals with both sides. The German government doesn't usually pay a lot, but they might pay a lot in this situation. Third, they don't risk being hanged. Oh, kidnapping is definitely their goal. Then, if that's true, why did they try to shoot him first? Poirot looked angry. Ah, that's what I don't understand. It doesn't make sense. Foolish. They have their plans ready, and good plans too, for kidnapping, but they risk everything with a dramatic attack, like in a movie, and just as unreal. It's hard to believe it with a group of masked men not even 20 miles from London. Maybe they were two different tries that happened without being related, I suggested. Ah, no. That would be too much of a coincidence. Then who is the traitor? There must have been a traitor, in the first event at least. But who was it, Daniels or O'Murphy? It had to be one of them, or why did the car leave the main road? We can't think that the Prime Minister planned his own death. Did O'Murphy make that turn on his own, or was it Daniels who told him to do it? It must have been O'Murphy's decision. Yes. Because if it was Daniels, the Prime Minister would have heard the order and ask why. But there are too many whys in this story, and they don't make sense together. If O'Murphy is a good man, why did he leave the main road? But if he was a bad man, why did he start the car again when only two shots were fired, maybe saving the Prime Minister's life? And... Again, if he was good, why did he, right after leaving Charing Cross, go to a famous meeting place of German spies? It looks bad, I said. Let's look at the situation carefully. What do we have for and against these two men? Take O'Murphy first. Against 
his strange behaviour in leaving the main road, that he is Irish from County Clare, that he has disappeared in a very interesting way. Four, his quick action in starting the car saved the Premier's life, that he is a Scotland Yard man and clearly a trusted detective. Now for Daniels. There isn't much against him except that we don't know about his past and that he speaks many languages for an Englishman. Excuse me, my friend, but you are not good at languages. For him, we have the fact that he was found tied up with his mouth covered and unconscious, which doesn't look like he had anything to do with it. He might have tied himself up to make people not suspect him. Poirot shook his head. The French police wouldn't make that kind of mistake. Also, once he got what he wanted and the Prime Minister was kidnapped, there wouldn't be much reason for him to stay. His friends could have tied him up and made him unconscious. But I don't see what they wanted to achieve with that. He can't help them much now because he will be watched closely until the Prime Minister's situation is clear. Maybe he wanted to make the police follow the wrong lead. But why didn't he do that? He only says something was put on his nose and mouth and he doesn't remember anything else. There's no wrong lead there. It seems like the truth. Well, I said looking at the clock, I guess we should leave for the train station. You might find more clues in France. Maybe, my friend, but I doubt it. I still can't believe the Prime Minister hasn't been found in that small area where hiding him must be very hard. If the military and police of two countries haven't found him, how can I? At Charing Cross, Mr Dodge met us. This is Detective Barnes from Scotland Yard and Major Norman. They will help you. Good luck. It's a difficult situation, but I still have hope. I have to go now. And the minister left quickly. We talked a little with Major Norman. In the middle of the small group on the platform, I saw a man with a small pointy face talking to a tall, light-haired man. He was an old friend of Poirot's, Detective Inspector Jap, known as one of the best officers at Scotland Yard. He came over and greeted my friend happily. I heard you were working on this too. Clever work. They've managed to keep the Prime Minister hidden so far. But I don't think they can hide him for long. Our people are searching all over France. And so are the French. I feel like it's just a matter of time now. But only if he's still alive, said the tall detective sadly. Jap looked worried. Yes, but I feel like he's alive. Poirot nodded. Yes, yes, he's alive. But can we find him in time? I, like you, didn't think he could be hidden for so long. The whistle blew, and we all got on the Pullman train car. The train left the station slowly. It was a strange trip. The Scotland Yard people stayed together. Maps of northern France were opened, and they pointed at roads and villages. Each person had their own idea. Poirot didn't talk much and looked like a confused child. I spoke with Norman, who was quite funny. When we got to Dover, Poirot's actions made me laugh a lot. The little man held my arm tightly as we got on the boat. The wind was blowing strongly. My goodness, he whispered. This is terrible. Be brave, Poirot, I said. You will succeed. You will find him. I'm sure of it. Ah, my friend, you misunderstand my feelings. It's this terrible sea that bothers me, seasickness. It's a horrible experience. Oh, I said, surprised. The first movement of the engines was felt and Poirot groaned and closed his eyes. Major Norman has a map of northern France if you want to study it. Poirot shook his head impatiently. No, no, leave me, my friend. To think clearly, the stomach and the brain must work together. 
Lavergier has an excellent way to avoid seasickness. You breathe in and out slowly like this, turning your head from left to right and counting to six between each breath. I left him to do his exercises and went on deck. As we slowly arrived at Bologna Harbour, Poirot appeared tidy and smiling, and whispered to me that Lavergier's method had worked wonderfully. Jap's finger was still following imaginary routes on his map. Nonsense. The car started from Boulogne. Here they went off the road. I think they moved the Prime Minister to another car. See? Well, said the tall detective, I'll go to the seaports. I bet they've hidden him on a ship. Jap shook his head. Too obvious. They closed all the ports right away. The day was just beginning as we arrived. Major Norman touched Poirot's arm. There's a military car here waiting for you, sir. Thank you, sir. But for now, I don't plan to leave Boulogne. What? No, we'll go to this hotel here by the dock. He did as he said, asked for a private room, and we followed him, confused and not understanding. He looked at us quickly. That's not how a good detective should act, right? I know what you're thinking. He must be full of energy. He must run around. He should look at the ground for tire marks with a small glass. He must pick up the cigarette ends, the dropped matches. That's your idea, isn't it? His eyes looked at us. But I echoed Poirot. Tell you it's not like that. The real clues are inside. Here. He tapped his forehead. Quietly and secretly they do their work until suddenly I ask for a map and I point to a place. Like this. And I say, the Prime Minister is there. And it's true. With method and logic, you can do Anything. This quick trip to France was a mistake. It's like playing a kid's game of hide and seek. But now, even if it's too late, I'll work the right way from within. Silence, my friends, please. And for five long hours, the little man sat without moving, blinking his eyes like a cat, his green eyes flickering and getting greener and greener. The Scotland Yard man was clearly not impressed, Major Norman was bored and impatient, and I found the time passed very slowly. Finally, I got up and walked as quietly as I could to the window. The situation was becoming silly. I was secretly worried about my friend. If he failed, I would have preferred him to fail in a less ridiculous way. Out of the window, I watched the daily leave boat with smoke coming out as it stayed near the dock. Suddenly I heard Poirot's voice next to me. My friends, let's go. I turned. My friend had changed a lot. His eyes were shining with excitement and his chest was puffed out. I've been foolish, my friends, but I finally see the way. Major Norman quickly went to the door. I'll order the car. There's no need. I won't use it. Thank goodness the wind has stopped. Do you mean you're going to walk, sir? No, my young friend. I'm not St. Peter. I prefer to cross the sea by boat. To cross the sea? Yes. To work with a method, you must start from the beginning. And this problem began in England. So we will go back to England. At three o'clock, we were once again at Charing Cross Station. Poirot didn't listen to our complaints, saying that starting at the beginning was the only way. On the trip, he spoke quietly with Norman, who sent many telegrams from Dover. Because of Norman's special passes, we moved quickly everywhere. In London, a big police car was waiting for us with some detectives in normal clothes. One of them gave Poirot a typed piece of paper. He saw my curious look. A list of small hospitals near London. I asked for it from Dover. We drove fast through the streets of London. We were on the Bath Road. 
we passed Hammersmith, Chiswick and Brentford, I started to understand our goal. We went through Windsor and reached Ascot. My heart jumped. Daniels had an aunt living in Ascot. We were looking for him, not O'Murphy. We stopped at a nice house. Poirot got out and rang the bell. I saw him looking worried. Clearly he wasn't happy. The door opened and he went inside. Soon he came back out and got into the car, shaking his head. I started to lose hope. It was past four o'clock. Even if he found proof against Daniels, what good would it be if we didn't know where the Prime Minister was in France? We went back towards London, stopping at different places. We left the main road and stopped at small buildings, which I knew were small hospitals. Poirot only spent a few minutes at each place, but at every stop he seemed more and more confident. He whispered something to Norman, who answered, Yes, if you turn left, you'll find them waiting by the bridge. We turned onto a side road, and in the low light, I saw another car waiting. It had two men in normal clothes. Poirot spoke to them, and then we started driving north, with the other car following. We drove for some time, aiming for a northern suburb of London. Finally, we stopped in front of a tall house with a yard. Norman and I stayed in the car. Poirot and one detective went to the door and rang the bell. A tidy maid answered. The detective said, I'm a police officer, and I have a warrant to search this house. The girl screamed a little, and a tall, good-looking, middle-aged woman appeared behind her in the hallway. Close the door, Edith. They might be burglars. But Poirot quickly put his foot in the door and blew a whistle. Immediately, the other detectives ran over and went into the house, closing the door behind them. Norman and I spent about five minutes upset about not being able to do anything. Finally, the door opened again and the men came out with three prisoners, a woman and two men. The woman and one man were taken to the second car. Poirot put the other man in our car. I have to go with the others, my friend, but be careful with this man. You don't know him, right? Well, let me introduce you to Mr. O'Murphy. O'Murphy. I stared at him with my mouth open as we started driving. He wasn't tied up, but I didn't think he would try to escape. He sat there looking straight ahead like he was confused. Anyway, Norman and I could handle him. To my surprise, we kept going north. We weren't going back to London. I was very confused. Suddenly, as the car slowed down, I realized we were near Hendon Aerodrome. I quickly understood Poirot's plan. He wanted to go to France by aeroplane. It was a brave idea, but it seemed impossible. A telegram would be much faster. Time was everything. He should let others save the Prime Minister. When we stopped, Major Norman got out and a detective took his place. He talked with Poirot for a few minutes, then left quickly. I also got out and grabbed Poirot's arm. Well done, my friend. They told you where they're hiding him. But you must send a telegram to France right away. You'll be too late if you go by yourself. Poirot looked at me strangely for a moment. Sadly, my friend... There are some things you can't send by telegram. At that moment, Major Norman came back with a young officer in a pilot's uniform. This is Captain Lyall, who will fly you to France. He can leave right now. Dress warmly, sir, said the young pilot. I can lend you a coat if you want. Poirot looked at his big watch. He whispered to himself, Yes, there's time. Just enough time. Then he looked up and politely bowed to the young officer. Thank you, sir. But I'm not your passenger. This man here is... He moved aside and a man came out of the darkness. It was the second male prisoner from the other car, and when the light showed his face, I gasped in surprise. It was the Prime Minister. Please tell me everything, I said impatiently, as Poirot, Norman, and I drove back to London. How did they get him back to England? 
They didn't need to bring him back. Poirot answered seriously. The Prime Minister never left England. He was kidnapped on his way from Windsor to London. What? I'll explain everything. The Prime Minister was in his car with his secretary next to him. Suddenly someone put a chloroform pad on his face. But who? By the smart language expert Captain Daniels. As soon as the Prime Minister is unconscious, Daniels uses the speaker and tells O'Murphy to turn right, which the driver does without suspicion. A short distance down that quiet road, a big car is waiting, looking like it had broken down. Its driver signals O'Murphy to stop. O'Murphy slows down. The stranger comes up. Daniels leans out of the window, and maybe using a fast-acting anaesthetic like ethyl chloride, does the chloroform trick again. In a few seconds, the two helpless men are taken out and put into the other car, and two fake men take their places. Impossible? Not at all. Haven't you seen people at shows copying famous people very well? Pretending to be a public person is easier than pretending to be an ordinary person like Mr. John Smith from Clapham. As for the fake O'Murphy, no one was going to pay much attention to him until after the Prime Minister left, and by then he would have left. He drives directly from Charing Cross to meet his friend. He goes in as O'Murphy, he comes out as someone completely different. O'Murphy is gone, leaving a trail that makes him look guilty. But the man who pretended to be the Prime Minister was seen by everyone. He wasn't seen by anyone who knew him well. And Daniels kept him away from people as much as he could. Also, his face was wrapped up, and any strange behaviour would be blamed on the shock of almost being killed. Mr. McAdam has a weak throat, so he doesn't talk much before a big speech. The trick was easy to keep going until they got to France. There, it wouldn't work, so the Prime Minister disappears. The police go to France, and no one checks the details of the first attack. To keep up the story that the kidnapping happened in France, Daniels is tied up and chloroformed in a believable way. And the man who played the Prime Minister? He gets rid of his disguise. He and the fake driver might be arrested as suspicious people, but no one will guess their real role in the story, and they will be let go because there's no proof. And the real Prime Minister? He and O'Murphy were taken to the house of Mrs. Everard in Hampstead, Daniel's so-called aunt. In fact, she is Frau Bertha Ebenthal, and the police have been looking for her for a while. It's a nice little gift I've given them, not to mention Daniels. Ah, uh, it was a smart plan, but he didn't count on the intelligence of Ecuo Pyro. I think my friend can be forgiven for feeling proud. When did you first start to think the truth? When I started working from the inside, I couldn't make the shooting fit in. But when I saw that the result of it was the Prime Minister going to France with his face wrapped up, I began to understand. And when I visited all the small hospitals between Windsor and London and found that no one like my description had his face treated that morning, I was sure. After that, it was very easy for a mind like mine. The next morning, Poirot showed me a telegram he got. It didn't say where it was from, and it wasn't signed. It said, in time. Later that day, the evening newspapers talked about the meeting of the countries. They focused on the great applause for Mr. David McAdam whose powerful speech had a strong and lasting effect. The End